دع الأيام تفعل ما تشاء وطب نفسا إذا حكم القضاء ولا تجزع لحادثة الليالي فما لحوادث الدنيا بقاء وكن رجلا على جهم بن صفوان who died in 746 common era, was a figure who invited condemnations from Sunni, Sunni theologians for his heretical views centuries after his death. Yet very little is known about his life and none of his own works are extant. To discuss with me today the life, works and legacy of this enigmatic figure is Dr. Yasser Qadi. Dr. Qadi completed his PhD at Yale on Ibn Taymiyyah's theology after his master's at the Islamic University of Medina, where his dissertation was on Jahan bin Safwan, Dr. Qadi resides in Dallas, Texas, and is the Dean of the Islamic Seminary of America. And he also ministers as an Imam at the East Plano Islamic Center in Plano, Texas. Welcome, Dr. Qadi. Assalamu alaikum, hello and welcome, and thank you for having me on, uh, on your podcast. Jahan bin Safwan was an administrator to a regional governor in the turbulent last years of the Umayyad dynasty and was executed by a rival ruler in a civil war in 746 Common Era. Before we look at his life, works and legacy, tell us what we know about the socio-political circumstances he lived in and the intellectual climate. So, well, Jahan bin Safwan was alive during the very end of the Umayyad dynasty and so he uh, lived and flourished during the decline of the Umayyad dynasty. The Umayyad, the Umayyad dynasty had already seen its heyday. And towards the end of the Umayyad dynasty, as is the case in all dynasties, there was quite a lot of tension within the royal family, a succession of Khulafa one after the other. And of course, the Umayyads and the Abbasids, uh, they always had to deal with internal revolts. Uh, of course, early Islam is marked by a myriad of uh, revolts. During Jaham's time, there was a number of interesting revolts uh, in his own region of Khurasan. Jaham lived and died in Khurasan. And Nasr ibn Sayyar, who was the last of the Umayyad governors appointed uh, to Khurasan, he was in charge, a very efficient and yet all, all obviously somewhat brutal. I mean, generally, they'd go hand in hand uh, governor. And Nasr ibn Sayyar had to battle a number of very important uh, rebellions during the time of Jaham. Uh, most importantly, from the Kharijites, you had somebody by the name of Bahlul from the, the Shiites, the proto Shiites. Of course, you had uh, Zayd ibn Ali, also the, the great 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 grandson of the Prophet, also uh, revolting, obviously not directly in Khurasan, but it did affect that time and frame. And most importantly, for our uh, lesson, the revolt in Khurasan against the Umayyads that Jaham joined. And this is the revolt led by Al Harith ibn Suraj. Al Harith ibn Suraj was a very enigmatic figure who seems to be a pietistic uh, fanatic, a pietistic, you know, overzealous person uh, who was calling for the Kitab and the Sunnah against the Umayyads, as if the Umayyads were not applying the Kitab and Sunnah. This is not a defense, or I'm just saying that's the reality. In those days, politics and religion were intertwined. And so, Almost every revolt that was politically motivated was also somehow religiously motivated. So Al Harith ibn Suraj led a military campaign against the Umayyads. He called for the overthrow of uh, Nasr ibn Sayyar. In fact, he actually was successful for a period of time in certain regions of Khurasan. And one of his points, very interestingly, he said that we want people of piety appointed, right? Uh, people of good uh, knowledge and manners, as if, like, again, the accusation was the Umayyads were evil people. And he said, we want to abolish the jizya against the converts. So the Umayyads were well known. As you know, the Abbasids, uh, part of the reasons they came to power was the issue of jizya. And so he is seeming to be some pietistic individual, and he appoints our guy, Jahan ibn Safwan to be his personal katib, which is like a senior lieutenant or a personal secretary. So this is on the political front. On the intellectual front, um, this is again a very, very exotic period. It seems like there's a whirlwind of ideas swirling around at the time. And again, it's very interesting. Um, uh, many Muslims have a very simplistic view of early Islamic history. The reality is, as usual, far, far more complicated, dare I say convoluted. And you have elements of, of proto-Shiism, uh, Zaydism and Ithna'ishism are going to come out. You have clear elements of extremist Ghulat Shiism. You have Qadarism on the on the intellectual front, people who affirmed Qadar and denied uh, and denied human uh, denied free will. 
Uh, you have Neo-Mu'tazilism. This is the era where Mu'tazilism is born. Right, Wasil ibn Atta is basically, you know, of this time frame. Uh, you have Kharijism in his glorious heydays. Uh, obviously, you have plenty of Kharijite sect. And then for our purposes, crucial for our purposes, you have Jaham and his teacher Ja'ad are introducing Neoplatonic thought into the Muslim world. And of course, this is eventually going to become uh, Ilmul Kalam. And of course, much more can be said, but that's a brief, um, brief answer to your question. Jaham bin Safwan was possibly of Persian stock and came to age in Central Asia. He was influenced in his ideas by a figure called Al-Ja'ad bin Dirham, who was executed apparently for his heretical views. Of the little we do know about Jahan bin Safwan's life, what can we be certain about? That's a very difficult question to answer, even in a dissertation, which I to do which I a very different time frame of my life um what can you be certain about depends on what you consider to be um evidence I mean we're pretty we're fairly certain that he existed I mean multiple references do mention him uh we are also fairly certain that he played a prominent political role in the uh, revolt as we mentioned of Al-Harith ibn Suraj uh, we know his name Jahan ibn Safwan but we do not know his lineage and this therefore makes it fairly certain that he is of non-Arab origin, which is what everybody says. We also know his kunya, Abu Mihraz, and we know that he affiliated with the Banu Rasib tribe as a Mawla. We also know that he probably never traveled outside of Khorasan, so he lived his entire life within the region of Khorasan, primarily in Tirmid and Samarkand. Of course, the problem comes, you're asking what we can be certain about his life, the problem comes the first books that we have that mention Jaham, two issues. Number one, chronological. Number two, basically source critical or who's, who's, who's mentioning this. As for chronological, the first books that mention Jaham have been authored a century or a century and a half after the era of Jaham. Books like Khalqa Fa'al al-Ibad of Imam al-Bukhari or the alleged Rad al jahmiya or I should say the Rad al jahmiya that is allegedly by Imam Ahmad or other books of this nature, they're obviously written at a very different time frame. And of course, the other problem is that they're written by obviously opponents of Jaham. And this will, I guess, we'll come back to this point later on. But again, the issue of how skeptical should we be and how trusting should we be of sources that are hostile to um, Jaham. Uh, what has been ascribed to him, and again, for the purposes of this podcast, I'll mention six points, much more can be said. But, and remember, by the way, my PhD and master's is, is in theology. So I'm coming to this from a theological perspective, not from the, uh, more from a historical, which is, of course, your area of expertise. But from a theological perspective, what has been ascribed to him, I'll summarize that in six points. Number one, he has been ascribed as claiming that faith or iman is purely knowledge based. In the Arabic is ma'rifa. So there is no need for even acceptance, much less action upon that knowledge all that is known is all that is needed is the knowledge of god that god exists so this is ma'rifa and of course this uh, does fit in with the neoplatonic thought number 2 it has been claimed that jaham was the first to introduce the kalam cosmological argument ibn taymiyyah is 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 one of those who makes this claim however to be honest this is highly debatable because we know for a fact that even the first generation of Mu'tazila uh, hadn't really developed uh, or fully flushed out the, the Kalam cosmological argument. So to claim that Jaham, who predates this, already has a, an argument in place seems a little bit of a, a, a stretch. Perhaps Jaham spoke about the need of proving God's existence intellectually, but uh, it is very, very doubtful that he actually had even uh, a rudimentary form of the Kalam cosmological argument. It's simply too early. The third issue, which is definitely verified, meaning if it, almost all the sources mention it, is his denial of the attributes. This is what Jaham is associated with. And of course, the question arises of what exactly he would have said versus what his opponents would have said. And even in my MA, which I wrote at a different phase of my intellectual life, again, 20 years ago, even in my MA and my advisor and my, um, uh, you know, the two readers were not too happy at, at this that I said, I, I said even in my MA, which is in print, that the claim that Jaham denied all the attributes simply doesn't fit in with what we know, even from Sunni sources. Rather, Jaham did not negate all the attributes. He had a specific ideology, which is that a theology, which is that anything that man is able to do or man is described with, 
cannot be described of God. So anything that is predicated on man's attributes, from man's attributes, must be negated from God's attributes. That is not the same as saying that he denied all the attributes. Very, very interestingly, Jaham, it is reported that he said, Laysa bi shay, that God is not a thing. Okay, uh, that God is not a thing. And this has been interpreted by many of our scholars as Jaham negating God's names and attributes. Of course, even back then I didn't understand. Now we understand, or I understand, that when Jaham is saying Laysa bi shay, he's basically denying that God is a being which is, of course, standard Neoplatonic thought. Uh, but uh, most of our scholars, when they read this, they understood Laysa Bishay as being, uh, as, as, as interpreting that God cannot be anything. Whereas, of course, what he means is that God cannot be a being. So that is his third point. He is negating specific attributes. The fourth point of Jaham that is, again, ascribed to him is that God cannot be described with a direction. Multiple early authorities claimed that Jaham said that God is everywhere like uh, air, kal hawa. Now, again, what does he mean by this? Does he mean a type of Spinozan pantheism? Or does he mean a pre-Kalam attempt to, to define God's transcendence, as the scholars of Ash'ari and, and Mu'tazili and, and Maturidi Creed would later say, that God cannot be described with a direction? What exactly did Jaham mean? Again, up for grabs, uh, question mark over that. The fifth, second to last issue is what again Jaham is well known for. And of course, Al Ash'ari says that, uh, Abu Hassan Al Ash'ari, in his maqalat, he says that Jaham was unique in all of Islam for claiming this. And that is to deny that man has any type of efficacy in his actions. So, Jaham is the father of what is called the Jabriya. And the Jabriya are pure fatalists. He would famously remark that men are like leaves in the wind. Wherever the wind goes, the leaves will follow. So too is Qadr, that whatever has been willed, they simply do it. And so man has no free will whatsoever. He is literally like a robot. Nobody else in um, Islamic history went to such an extreme to deny that man has any uh, efficacy over his actions whatsoever. And the final point that we'll mention uh, and again, much more in my dissertation is, you know, in print, it's 800 pages. So it's a lot of stuff there. But the final point we'll mention for the podcast is Jaham uh, claimed that heaven and hell are not eternal. And again, this is unique. No other uh, no other theology, no other person uh, ascribing to Islam claimed that heaven and hell are, are going to be basically extinguished. Now, of course, this is interesting because where he's coming from is actually a theological point, which is to affirm the uniqueness of God being eternal, both pre-eternal and semi-eternal. So God alone is eternal and God has been and God shall be. And therefore, for Jaham to claim that any other creation shall be for all of eternity is impeding or infringing on God's etern eternality. And therefore, Jaham claimed that heaven and hell would eventually be extinguished or destroyed and only God would remain. So these are some of the things that um, have been ascribed to Jaham and some seem to be fairly certain, we can say, and others, like I said, uh, a bit of a question mark over. Though he was executed shortly before the Abbasid revolution, the so-called so Jahmiya occupied much of the thoughts and activities of subsequent generations of Sunni scholars and perhaps other sects too. Tell us about Jahmism, the intellectual legacy. So, Jaham lived and died. Uh, 128 he was executed. And his ideas did not really live on directly in his students, but they lived on and they took on an imagination of their own in the minds of his opponents, which is really interesting. So Jaham himself, actually his followers are negligible. In fact, we don't even know of a community or a group that called themselves the followers of Jaham. And even, I mean, some early Sunni sources mentioned he barely had maybe 10 followers. And Max, I found in one reference, was he, he barely had 50 followers. One even said he barely had two followers. And this does seem to be the case that he was more of a political agitator than a theologian. But as a political agitator or as a person who had some influence, he also had theological views. And the theological views he had, as I said, they lived 
on much more uh, in the imagination of his opponents than in the actual following that he had in his life. And his opponents took the appellate Jahmiyyah and constructed a very interesting trope out of it. The term itself, as I said, took on a life of its own and multiple treatises were written by some of the giants of you know, uh, traditionalist Sundism. Um, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal has a book that is ascribed to him. Now, whether it is his or not is, again, uh, another interesting topic. But again, definitely, it's a very early treatise, whoever wrote it. And Arrad uh, al-Jahmiyyah, he called it refuting the Jahmites. Uh, Imam al-Bukhari, in his uh, famous Sahih, he has his uh, the very last chapter, uh, which is called Kitab al-Tawheed wa rad al al-Jahmiyyah. So again, refuting the Jahmites. Uh, Ad-Darimi has treatises again refuting the Jahmites. Um, uh, Ibn Batta has a treatise called refuting the Jahmites. Ibn Abi Hatim has a treatise called refuting the Jahmites. And on and on. There's like half a dozen treatises, all of them with the same title, refuting the Jahmites. But who are these Jahmites that they're refuting? Well, if you read the treatises, in reality, they're refuting people whom we would either call proto-Mu'tazila or the Mu'tazila. And in fact, maybe even uh, some people who would be closer to Ash'arism even. So they're being refuted in this time frame. Therefore, what happens is that the term Jahmiya becomes the term that early Sunni uh, traditionalists use to describe any group that they disagree with in terms of the issue of the attributes. And therefore, somebody like Ibn Hazm can come along, you know, in the fourth century, the fifth century, and make the somewhat preposterous claim that the Ash'aris, uh, the Ash'aira, are the real followers of Jaham ibn Safwan, right? This is what Ibn Hazm claimed, because from his mind, anybody who negated the attributes or made that wheel of the attributes is basically a, a, a Jahmite. And so we have to be a little bit more careful because the term really did become a smear or somewhat of a slur, an ad hominem. To be called a Jahmite was simply to, to reject your credibility and your credentials. And we have in our books of tabaqat of all of the uh, madahib and all of the firaq, this appellate Jahmi. He was a Jahmi. He was a Jahmi. And when you look at the person's theology, you find actually a, a relatively large spectrum of beliefs that come under the umbrella uh, Jahmite. And so I find that very interesting. And actually, definitely more research needs to be done uh, about how the term was co-opted, if you like, by a certain group of scholars and then used to refute any type of deviation when it comes to, uh, from their perspective, again, when it comes to understanding God's attributes. But to conclude, I mean, in this particular question, I mean, the legacy of Jaham himself, the direct legacy, seems to be very minimal, to be honest. But the, the, the controversy generated around him and for him and through him and the notions that were then ascribed to him, that is where his legacy primarily lies. And how much of it can actually be attributed to him or not, I think that's something that definitely is still up for, for research and study. Let us turn to the historiography of the sources and methods on Jahan bin Safwan and his legacy. All of what we know about him and his ideas are taken from his opponents, and even if we assume their integrity, there would still be a historical, historiographical need to reclaim as much as we can of his original voice with source critical readings and perhaps turn to other non Sunni, perhaps even non Muslim written and material sources. The anecdote of Jahan bin Safwa and missing prayers employs a topos of 40 days, a number significant in wider so called Near Eastern cultures. It is a literary device. What would you like to see in any future works on Jahan bin Safwan specifically and the history of Islamic theology more generally? So that's a very good uh, question. Um, and I think that we need to, to understand that there are different types of people doing research in early Islamic history and early Islamic theology. I, I come from a background where, again, I, I did my, my first degree uh, in theology from the University of Medina, which has a very different paradigm. And then, uh, which is my MA, and then my master, my PhD was from uh, Yale, which again has a very different paradigm. And I, I am a firm believer that both paradigms have their strengths and weaknesses. I'm a firm believer. Having gone through both systems, I think that uh, we cannot dismiss the other paradigms except at our own peril. Now, I, I guess uh, I will primarily be speaking to a Muslim audience for the next few minutes when I say that Muslim researchers in particular they need to become more cognizant of the sources and the biases of our own sources. Uh, I think one of the problems that uh, many Muslim researchers have, Muslim academics have, is that they're extremely trusting 
of uh, sources that they are already inclined towards. And by and large, source criticism, historical source criticism is really frowned upon from within Muslim circles. And I'll be the first to say, it took me many years of, of my own research, uh, you know, after leaving the Medina environment, it took me many years of understanding the human nature of biases to understand that we cannot just take what a uh, sixth century Sunni theologian said about uh, uh, Jaham and accept it as a fact, even if we love the sixth century author, even if we admire him. And uh, one of the, the anecdotes that I, well, not the anecdotes, one of the hadith narrations that I quote uh, when I teach critical thinking to my own students at the Islamic Seminary of, uh, of America is the anecdote or the hadith in Sahih Bukhari of the lady who complained to the Prophet وسلم, about her husband you know, and how he treated her and how he didn't pray and how he didn't do this and that. And the fact that, you know, when you when he called the husband, the husband explained himself, we discovered that the lady is not actually lying at all. But the lady has a selective bias. The lady is picking certain things out of context and then presenting them to the Prophet Wasallam. If we can understand that this can happen to two companions, right? You have selective bias. How much more so when we have intersectarian bias, right? So again, when it comes to this issue of Jahma bin Safwan, I mean, if you read, I don't want to mention the, the, the person because he's highly admired and respected. Let's just say one of the main icons of Sunni Islam. If you read how he describes uh, Jaham, you know, he will say that he was a, a, a person of evil, a person of jadal and munadhara. Uh, and yet when you read uh, as Safadi, who is a more neutral historian and basically somebody who's coming to it from a pure historical perspective, you know, as Safadi says that uh, Jaham al-Safwan kana dha adabin wa nadharin wa dhaka'in wa fikrin wa jidalin wa mira, right? So notice how he shifts it around. He doesn't negate that Jaham was argumentative, but he says he was an argumentative person, but he was also a person of learning, a person of letters, a person of intellect, a person who would think deeply, right? So notice how a Safadi describes Jaham and our Sunni icon, one of the icons of, of, of Islam, basically eliminates the first five or six adjectives and then says he was always argumentative and maybe he was argumentative and again please don't misunderstand this as a defense of jaham not at all i mean i have no idea that he had views that are definitely not mainstream and orthodox in sunnism uh so this isn't a defense but it is an issue of how much should we trust the sources let me give you one more example about jaham which really illustrates the point one of the most common anecdotes that is narrated about jaham in fact in my ma i have a, a, this anecdote a, without question because that was a different phase of my life is the anecdote of jaham picking up uh, the Quran and throwing it on the ground and stomping on it. Okay, this is mentioned by a number of early authors, including Imam al-Bukhari, for example, right? Now, again, this is an anecdote that nobody ever, uh, you know, doubts or whatnot. At the same time, let us be a little bit more critical. And this is not a defensive jam. If he did this, then this is without a doubt a type of, of, of heretical, you know, blasphemy that no two Muslims would differ over. But did he really pick up a copy of the Quran and throw it on the floor and stomp on it? Does that really make sense for somebody to do? Uh, in a Muslim land and environment to have such a, a level of hatred. Let's look at who narrates this. When we look at the narration, it all goes back to one particular individual, uh, Abu Naim al-Balkhi, who is hardly known as a narrator of hadith. He's barely acceptable you know, as a narrator. And then he says, an anonymous friend of Jaham's told me. Right, somebody whom we don't know who that person was. Right, Somebody who uh, we have no clue who he was. So. All of this story goes back to a person who is really not well known for knowledge. And he's just, like I said, somebody, uh, Abu Naim al-Balkhi. He's there. We know he existed. We don't know much about him. He does not narrate any of the famous hadith of any of the famous books of, of hadith. He's not a, uh, you know, a well-known. In fact, he was known for Qira'at Shadda, which again, a whole different point altogether. Yet we trust Abu Naim al-Balkhi when he narrates from Mr. Anonymous because it fits our narrative of Jahm. And again, this is not a defense of Jahan, but let us be fair here. Would that hold up in a court of law? Would that would that be fair? Would we like one of our enemies to say something like that about us with a complete, you know, brazenly broken chain full of, uh, you know, so here's the point. What do we really know about Jaham? That's a very good question. And I think that's where further research will continue uh, needs to be done. But I agree with you that we should approach some of these tropes with a, a healthy degree of, of, of skepticism, not because we are impugning the character of these great imams and authors, but because 
when you already have a bias against somebody, it is only natural that uh, a small issue will be exaggerated and that maybe even a mistake uh, will become uh, something very evil or or maybe even an outright lie is not going to be verified and then passed on by trustworthy sources. So when we call for uh, source critical thinking and when we call for being a little bit more careful about what our own sources say, this is not at all to impugn the integrity and the character of the great imams and the scholars of Ahl sunnah Rather, it is simply being human. If the Sahabi wife and the Sahabi husband, it can be discovered that neither is lying, but it's simply selective, then surely, you know, mimbai uh, bi'awla, a fortiori, we should, uh, we should be a little bit more care, uh, careful when you know uh, people of different sects and schisms are described in our own books and Allah knows best. Finally, tell us about any current projects and forthcoming works and any last words for our listeners. Well, uh, forthcoming projects. So I have multiple projects that I'm doing, but I guess uh, for this podcast, I guess what you'll be most interested in, uh, I've been writing for the longest time a book on, on Salafism for One World Press. So uh, inshallah, I hope that, uh, I mean, I'm in almost the final stages, but again, because I'm so busy with my so many other projects, but uh, this is going to be a book that uh, is interesting, hopefully, because uh, it is coming from someone who was definitely an insider of the movement. And still, at this phase of my life, I have not, uh, I'm, as I said, I have moved on, not moved against. I, I'm basically, uh, I appreciate what the movement gave me and how it shaped me, but I no longer subscribe to the movement. But having been an insider and having been somebody who studied for 10 years at Medina, I, I'm going to be you know, bringing in a side of Salafism that is at once sympathetic and also uh, softly critical as well. And I hope that it will be of use to all people, people inside the movement, outside the movement, and uh, describe the historical reality of the, the, the movement as it currently exists and link it to previous iterations and manifestations, which, again, I think the movement does itself an injustice when it does not, uh, when it does not fully understand uh, its own roots and has a very, very simplistic notion of its own existence. Uh, you know, the notion that Salafism has existed untouched and pristine in its original form for all 14 centuries. Hopefully this book will clarify that that is definitely not the case. But yeah, that is my, one of my main projects I'm working on now. Dr. Qadi, thank you for being our guest. Thank you for interviewing me and wish you all the best in your PhD as well, inshallah. Oh,